of strength. We come now to the blessing of our gifts. We take a moment every Sunday morning to acknowledge and, and thank and then pray over all the gifts and everyone who gives them, uh, everything that makes this church continue to be what it is. We mentioned already this morning the, the group that's writing cards and how awesome that's been. There's the program committee going on. There's so many other things that are happening. Everybody's wearing multiple hats. Everything that you give makes this place continue to be what it is, a place where God is writing God's name. And that's a significant thing. And without those gifts, it's just an empty building. So thank you so much to everyone who's remained faithful. God sees your work, and so do I. Let's take a moment now and bless all of those gifts. Father God, mother to all who have no one to care for them, open our eyes to see Jesus alive in those who are abandoned and lonely. Let our giving reflect a genuine love for them, just like the gift you gave us in your Son, who demonstrated to us the depth of your great love. Receive our gifts, O God, and bless them, we pray. May they speed the coming of your kingdom in our community. Amen. pray. Loving God, you call us to your service, to be your eyes and ears, hands and voice in this, your world, to open our eyes not only to the beauty and love which you create, but the injustice, hate, and suffering that humankind generates, to open our ears not only to the chattering of this coming week, but the searching fears, and questioning of all whom we shall meet. You call us to service, O God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, 
as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. You call us to service, gracious God, to be your eyes and ears, hands and voice in this, your world, to open our hands not only to those with whom we choose to share our lives, but in welcome, love, and fellowship to all those you draw near, to open our mouths in love, to speak the truths you lay upon our hearts, your word for this, your world. Amen. Susan, I've got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to do my own lecturing for today. Good with that. So our first reading comes from the Hebrew Scriptures. I'm reading from the book of Deuteronomy, which I have to find really quick here. When I was young, I memorized all the books of the, of the Bible in order, and I think I still have it. I think I could do it from memory. I'm not going to do it now. Maybe that could be a question somebody asked me later on. All right, so Deuteronomy uh, chapter 15, starting in verse 7. If there is any among you in need, a member of your community in any of your towns within the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand, willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. Give liberally and be ungrudging when you do so, for on this account the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. Since there will never cease to be some need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. For the word of God in scripture. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from an epistle. I'm reading from the epistle to the Philippians, starting in chapter 3 and verse 7. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. For the word of God among us. And then finally, a reading from the gospel. A reading from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, and starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and gave you clothing. 
And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. For the word of God within us. Praise you, Okay, so at this time, as promised, we're going to open it up for questions, prompts, anything you'd like me to get going about. So somebody's going to have to go first. Okay, yeah, Jen. Um, so I'm going to be going to a funeral tomorrow for um, my cousin's father, a very sweet man, and it's going to be a Catholic funeral, and I always run into the issue of do I take communion when I'm there, because, you know, it's kind of a confusing issue. So what are people's or your specific thoughts? Obviously, you follow the rule of that particular church, but I always find myself with a little bit of a, I don't know, spiritual issue. Sure. Uh, Mike, was that able to be heard on the stream? Could you hear that? I, I don't know. Or should I repeat it? it? Test one, two, three. Okay, I will repeat it just to be sure. So the question is, uh, someone's going to a Catholic funeral, and should they take communion if it's offered? Uh, so the short answer to that question, and I'll, I'll expand on it in a little bit, is if they offer it, take it. Uh, There is a number of things going on in Christianity that divide us from each other, one of which being the Catholic view, or traditional Catholic view of communion. And in my opinion, those are things that as the kingdom of God moves forward that we're gonna to have to overcome. And you'll see that movement happening in certain churches. There are certain churches where the minister or the priest or whomever will just open communion to everyone. This is the bread of life for all who are hungry. Right? And that's, I think, the heart of God. But there are others in which that's not the case. So if you see that movement happening in a church and they're offering communion, then I think as someone who's a disciple of Christ, there's no reason why you shouldn't partake. And if you're not offered communion, then I think it's a moment to pray that God's kingdom would be established there and that they would begin to see and to know and, and to live into the heart of God for including everyone. All right. Is that good enough answer, or do you need more than that? All right. Thanks so much. Yep. All right. Others. Is yeah. Microphone working now. Is the microphone working? Yeah, it's working. Um, I have issues with the what's going on in Ukraine. My son-in-law's over in Germany and he was deployed to Slovakia, which is on the border of Ukraine. And I was wondering what, as a church, do we think we could do to be more helpful to that cause? Well, I don't know if, if you're aware of it already, but we've got some collection efforts going. Uh, there's a couple of organizations and local establishments who are uh, collecting from the community and then shipping over to uh, Ukraine directly. One of them is the, um, the Ukrainian Federal Credit Union, and then there's a couple of others as well that we're partnering with. I forget off the top of my head what they are, uh, but I know that Sherry would know and Anne would know. So we have some efforts that are ongoing, but I understand also the feeling of frustration. There is something that's a humanitarian disaster that's going on, and you feel like you want to do something to help, something more than you know, sending deodorant. And the truth is that from the position that we're in, the best thing that we can do is pray. And I know that seems trite, but as I've been teaching on prayer, I, I think that it's become clear to us that prayer moves the will of God forward, right? That God has a will that God desires to see done in the world and that God chooses human beings to be agents of that will. And it could be anybody, but when we take the time to seek and to understand and to know and then to pray the will of God, it happens to be us that almost are picking up the baton and moving it forward. So when we pray the will of God for a situation, that is a powerful prayer. 
It's a prayer that James says is powerful and effective. Uh, James gives the example of Elijah in Scripture who prayed and it stopped raining on the whole earth for three and a half years and then he prayed again and then it started up raining after three and a half years of no rain. Prayer can do things like that when it's an expression of what God wants to be doing, right? So the thing is that trying to see specifically what God wants to do on the ground in Ukraine and in the people that can influence the situation is very hard. It's very hard to see what God might do, how God might do it. But when we take the time, and I think especially as a church body, when we come together and two or more are gathered in his name, that, that is to seek his will, and we say, Lord, we want to move your will forward. What is it? So that we can pray it, so that we can be a part of it if possible. Maybe as we pray, there, that opens up something that we didn't know we could do, something that the Spirit moves us to do that we're not seeing right now. But either way, it has to come to us and through us from God. There's a lot of people praying for Ukraine, and there's a lot of people praying a lot of different prayers, but the only ones that matter are the ones that express the will of God. So that's the thing that we can be doing. And, and as we do that, Maybe there's something more that we can do, but I think to see it, we're going to have to see it through the eyes of God. Um, any follow-up questions? Okay. Yeah, Lauren. Sure, absolutely. I mean, there's, you got to figure, there's, there's, what is it, 7.5 billion people in the world, and many of them offer prayers of many different kinds. I would venture to guess that not all of them are good. Wouldn't you say that's probably a fair guess, that there's people out there praying for the death of their enemies and, you know, for all kinds of terrible things? that they think that God wants because they've so deluded their minds. I mean, that's going on in the world. You see it. People doing things in the name of God that ought not be done. Just because people do or pray a thing in the name of God, it doesn't mean that God was behind it, right? And we can tell the difference very easily. When someone does something that causes pain and injury, that is violent, that seeks to control and exploit people, that seeks to motivate them with fear, that seeks to push back against what we know to be the clear movements of God, against love and inclusion and diversity and peace. Those things very clearly are not of God. Those things are not God's will. So even if somebody is out there praying for them, that doesn't affect what God's will is. God's will is clear. God's will has been decided, as we read in Scripture, from the foundation of the world. The kingdom has been prepared since the, the words were uttered, let there be light. So what you pray and don't pray doesn't affect that. But when you take the time, like I said, to see what God's will is, to pray it, and then as the Spirit leads you to do it, that's where it's powerful. That's where prayer matters. Because then you partner with what God is doing. So when someone, let's say there's someone who has a good heart, and they've just believe the propaganda, right? They're, say, say they're a Russian, for example, and they've just believed the government propaganda, and they're, and they're genuinely praying with, with a pure heart to God, God, help you know, our country to do X and Y and Z. That's a moment where, in prayer, because you're taking the time to connect with God, God is able then to minister to that person's heart and to show them, my way is not violence. My way is not empire. My way is not this. And in that prayer, even though it was misguided to begin with, God is able to straighten a person out, right? So I think that that's the ministry. But then, of course, there are other people who, even though they're praying, are not taking the time to listen. You know, they're offering prayers, really, 
to their own gods. Gods of empire, gods of violence, gods of wealth, right? And so I think God's able to tell the difference. Yeah. A couple more. Yeah. whether it's in a personal level or a global level, how do you get to that point of being able to offer forgiveness? Well, I always start at the beginning with forgiveness, which is the quintessential example, and you know already what I'm going to say. Christ hanging from the cross, looking out on the people who are literally in the process of murdering him. And what does he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So here's the question. Didn't they know what they were doing? They knew full well that they were crucifying a man. And then they knew why. He was a, he was a political threat. He was a threat to empire. He was a threat to stability. He was a threat to the status quo. And so they killed him. Plain and simple. They knew what it was. Didn't they know what they were doing? Well, I tend to take Jesus at his word on that one. They didn't. And how, how can that be? It's because there is such a thing as spiritual deception that the wool can be pulled over people's eyes. People can be deluded into thinking that they're doing something right and good and necessary when it's not at all. They've just been deceived. So Jesus saw that. He saw that these people were doing something they thought was right and necessary, but clearly they, it wasn't. And he said, I don't hold it against them. They didn't know. They were deceived. And that's the answer to your question. When you think about all these people out there that are perpetrating all of these terrible things, and you think about Ukraine, right? You think about somebody like Vladimir Putin, who is really the driving force behind all of this. We realize that even though he's the face and the name, that he's not really the driving force, is he? Right? That there are other forces at work. Forces that want to see empire rule the earth. That want to see the pursuit of wealth and power uh, drive humanity to be and to do what that looks like, as it has done for thousands of years. Things that want to keep the status quo exactly the same. The same forces that crucified Jesus. They're still at work today. And we see them in Ukraine, among other places. Otherwise, how could you explain that 2,000 years later, we're still doing the same things, and it's as if there's been no progress at all? Things, things didn't change. The heart of man did not change. The spiritual forces that drive man did not change. But... One thing did. Our God has appointed Jesus as Lord over the earth to establish God's kingdom, and God's kingdom is being established in Ukraine, even though we can't see it. I know it. I know that, that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, and it shall not. I know that. That's why Jesus can hang from the cross and let himself be killed, because he knows that death cannot overcome it. Nothing can overcome the will and the movement of God. So, we look out and we see deluded and deceived people of God, and children of God, who are doing terrible things, and we say, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they do. All right, I think we've got time for one more. Close my Bible for this one. All right. So the truth is that throughout uh, human history, religion has been co-opted as a tool of the empire. It's become complicit with violence. 
And you, you can see it all the way throughout history, right? You, you see how the early Christians joined Rome and signed off on all the Roman wars. And you see how the, the church partnered with the, the different empires through the Middle Ages and gave its okay to colonialism and slavery. It's been going on. So I would say very much religion has been used as a tool of those same forces that want to keep things going the way they are. And people have been deceived by that, thinking that God wills it. I think there was even a pope that said that about the Crusades. God wills it, right? I don't think God will death and violence. So, I think we have to draw a distinction at some point between what's authentic and what is corrupted. We're trying to practice something authentic here. We're trying to practice religion in a way that moves us away from empire, away from violence, away from the pursuit of wealth and power. Because that's what the world has been about, right? We have to do it differently. That's what the will of God is. The will of God is peace. The will of God is equality and unity, diversity. And when religion strays from that, and when it gives in to all those forces that, that keep things so terrible, it loses touch with God. And it does things like justify war and even promote war. So unfortunately, yeah, there's been wars waged in the name of God that God had nothing to do with. I hate to say it, but it's true. I don't want to end on that note. Get somebody give me something good. <laughs> somebody give me something good to end with. How old are my kids? Uh, my youngest, or my middle one, just had a birthday. She's 13. And then my oldest is 15. And my youngest is 10. All girls. And I'm pulling my hair out. <laughs> as, as a parent, have you ever just wanted to light yourself on fire? <laughs> That's about, that's about where we are. So, no, I, I love my girls. And uh, no, for most of you, your, your grandparents, I know, um, Dave, you're, you've got you know, your kids, but for, the most, for most of us, I think we're, we're coming at it like the standpoint of grandparents. Um, and it's a lot more fun to be a grandparent. It's a lot more fun, <laughs> Anne says. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so to the extent that you can, um, the only thing I would say is help your kids stay sane because they're not <laughs> at this point. All right. That's a, that's a better note to end on. Thank you guys so much for indulging me on this. Uh, I, think, I think it went well. So let's go ahead and move now into the uh, homily hymn, uh, number 541. They asked, Who is my neighbor?
We come now to the prayers of the people. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Prayers for Carmela as she is dealing with illness. Lord, in your mercy. Uh, there's a list of five people uh, or five different things from the website that we're going to pray for. Uh, and I don't have any specifics on these, so we'll just list them. Uh, prayers for baby Holly, for Brenda, for Bruce, for Ethan, and for all of our essential workers as in many circles, COVID drags on. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for Dorothy as she deals with a lot of stress. Lord, in your mercy. Uh, I hear that it's Mother's Day in England. I bet you'll never guess who told me that. Uh, but we offer prayers of joy for family and friends who are celebrating in England. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers of joy. Uh, prayers uh, for the family and friends of, looks like Roger, not our Roger. No. Okay. Uh, who is who uh, passed away recently. Prayers for their comfort and their peace in that in their grief they would find each other. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for uh, the Ripton family that has experienced a death recently. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for Matthew. Prayers that he would remain safe. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers of joy for a uh, thanks for a visit from Melody's grandchild. So we offer prayers of joy. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers of joy. And then finally, our prayers for Melody as she undergoes surgery. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And now we pray together with the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn, this is the one we sing on all the Sundays of the month that are not the first, number 77, Lord dismiss us with your blessing, verses 1 and 3. Please remain standing in body or spirit now for our benediction. Go now and embrace the hope to which God has called us. We will recognize our courage and friend and strength. Christ has been gracious to you, people of God. So we will be gracious also, especially to those in need. Now our service is ended. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. And, and thanks be to God. Be to God.